Oh, we left off talking about the stomach and different secretions that are coming out of these cells that are within the gastric glands. And so now what we want to say is, how do those cells know to release these secretions, right? And so we're going to have both neuro, uh, neural as well as hormonal mechanisms, homeostatic mechanisms that are kicking in so that the stomach knows, hey, there's food in here, or food is coming here, let's get these secretions going so that we can mix these juices with the food and make chyme, and let's start breaking down um, proteins, let's start unraveling proteins, and let's start cleaving the bonds, the peptide bonds that are holding the amino acids together. So in terms of neural mechanisms, most of this, I shouldn't say most, um, you're going to have both long reflexes, which again are the ones that involve the central nervous system, <clears throat> and the long reflexes are going to be mostly mediated by the vagus nerve, meaning that the vagus nerve, vagus nerve is a big nerve, and it is full of sympathetic axons, sorry, parasympathetic axons. <clears throat> And the vagus nerve branches to many different organs in your body, one of which being the salivary glands that we talked about. Um, we talked last quarter about the heart is actually controlled by the vagus nerve, some aspects. And then also down here at the stomach, the vagus nerve is going to come down to the stomach and cause these various cells to release their secretions. Now we're also going to have local or enteric reflexes, which again are just short reflexes that don't involve the central nervous system. And then we're going to have hormones. And again, we're not going to talk about all the hormones. The hormone that I want you guys to be familiar with is gastrin. And we said that gastrin is a hormone that's released from G cells, which are just a special type of enteroendocrine cell that are there in these gastric glands. So when we look at how these cells know to release their secretions, there's actually three different phases that are occurring to regulate gastric secretions. And these phases are happening pretty much in this order, but there will be some overlap that's occurring. So the first one is called the cephalic phase. And I'm just going to go over here. This is a good summary slide of these phases. These would be the excitatory events, which is what we're looking at. How do these glands release their secretions? And over here, this is looking at what causes those secretions to be inhibited. But in terms of the cephalic phase, this is a pretty short phase. It's only going to last a few minutes. And what the stimuli is that's going to trigger this phase is going to be thinking about food, smelling food, looking at food, anything that has to do with your brain in processing the thought of food, seeing food, smelling food, hearing food, being prepared, that's going to trigger this reflex. And so what happens is your cerebrum is going to be involved. Cerebrum is going to send inputs down to the hypothalamus, and then maybe down to the medulla oblongata also. And then coming out of these areas, you're going to have parasympathetic fibers, again, mostly through the vagus nerve, that's coming down to the stomach and stimulating the cells of the gastric glands so that we start to release gastric juices, and with those juices, hydrochloric acid, pepsinogen, that then will make pepsin, and then we get this little positive feedback loop that gets set up. So what this is doing, the whole point of this, is to get these gastric juices secreted before food ever gets down to the stomach. So it's kind of like priming the stomach, so that when food does get down to the stomach, we have juices right there, and we can start mixing that food with the juices and get started on that digestion. So again, this is only going to last a few minutes, once we actually get food in the stomach, then we go into the gastric phase. And this is the long phase. This is when food is in the stomach and receptors are being activated here in the stomach that we have secretions being released. 
And this is going to last several hours because food will generally stay in the stomach around four to six hours. If it's a really fatty meal, it might stay in a little bit longer because fats are just harder to process. They're not water soluble. And so it just, fats tend to slow the whole system down a bit. So what happens here is we're going to have the stretch receptors getting activated. So as food gets in the stomach, the stomach stretches, that activates these receptors. Those receptors then send their information along visceral sensory nerves up to the medulla, up to the hypothalamus, process that information, and then that causes the vagus nerve to keep its activity high. That causes the gastric glands to be stimulated and we have secretions being released. Now, we can also have short reflexes happening here. So the receptors get activated, that information gets processed right in the stomach, and then we have local or enteric nerves that stimulate those gastric glands and again release secretions. <coughs> then we've got various chemoreceptors that will start to become activated. And various things will activate these chemoreceptors. Um, peptides usually activate these chemoreceptors, sometimes caffeine, Changes in pH can activate these chemoreceptors. And what's going to happen here is we're going to have G cells becoming activated. And the G cells are going to release gastrin, a hormone. Now again, these G cells are part of the gastric glands. So gastrin gets released. Gastrin is going to enter the bloodstream because it is a hormone. But it's not going to travel very far. It's just going to travel right there to the stomach and have its effects. And gastrin is going to tell the gastric gland, hey, release some secretions. So we're going to have lots of things, lots of various stimuli telling these glands release their secretions. So again, as long as there's food in the stomach, those glands are being stimulated by hormones, by nerves, and secretions are going to be released. This is also um, why you want to have good motility. If you don't have good motility and you can't get that material after a couple hours into the small intestine because your previous meals aren't moving from the small intestine to the large intestine or from the large intestine down to the anus to be defecated, if that's not happening, then food can end up staying in the stomach for long periods of time. And if that happens, we're going to keep releasing these secretions, which means more and more HCLs being released, and that can start to um, become problematic in the stomach. Remember, those are really harsh chemicals, and they're fine. The stomach has lots of protective mechanisms, but if you're forcing excess secretions, excess acid to stay in your stomach, then those protective mechanisms can start breaking down. Does um, the fact of whether you're standing or laying down decrease or in, or increase motility? The reason I ask is just because, like, you hear if you have bad acid reflux or something like that, to not eat after, like, 5 or 6 at night, um, and that can help decrease that. And I was wondering if that's because of if you're upright, in the motility is better, so you don't make as much of that, or does that have anything so bearing on it? So, motility is really not going to be affected by whether you're horizontal or vertical, because okay. motility is about stimulating those smooth muscle cells in muscularis externa. Okay. And so that's going to be mediated through nerves, the nervous system, and hormones. The key thing with that is, if you eat late at night, and then you've got food in your stomach for another four to six hours, the chance that you're going to go to sleep while you still are way into the gastric phase is pretty high. And if you are having a lot of activity in your stomach when you're laying down and you're prone to having reflux, then it's more likely that because of gravity not helping, that material can go back into the esophagus. Yeah. So the reason why you get nauseated when you're really hungry because you're doing the cephalic phase, your stomach's releasing acid, but there's no food in there, so your stomach is getting up. That can definitely be a factor. Yeah, that can be a factor. Um, 
also, <coughs> if you do have slow motility and you end up having those secretions in your stomach for long periods of time, even if you've just eaten, sometimes that can make you throw up also. Mm -hmm. So those various chemicals, some people are going to be, and the reason you throw up is receptors get activated. They send information up to a vomiting center in your, uh, I can't remember if it's in the hypothalamus or in the medulla, one of those areas, maybe both. And then that comes down and causes muscles to contract and you vomit. So some people are really sensitive to those various chemicals activating those receptors. So it could very well be that that's the case. Okay, so then we go down into the intestinal phase. And the intestinal phase is a little bit weird because initially it's going to do one thing and then it's going to change and do something else. So what happens with the intestinal phase is, remember we said that when the chyme starts to leave the stomach and goes into the small intestine, it's going to do so very little bit at a time. So every time the stomach is contracting down here in the pyloric region where we do peristalsis, up in the body we're doing segmentation, mixing. But down the pyloric region where we're doing peristalsis, we're going to have about three mils of chyme going through that pyloric valve with every wave of contraction. Now again, if the pieces of food aren't small enough, then they won't go through and they'll get kicked back up here into the body where segmentation is happening and we'll keep breaking it down into smaller pieces. But initially, as we start to put that little bit of chyme over here into the small intestine, that's going to activate receptors there in the small intestine. And what that's gonna do is it's going to cause intestinal gastrin to be released. Now, intestinal gastrin is going to act and look just like gastrin that comes from the G cells of the gastric glands. But intestinal gastrin is made by these cells here in the duodenum, the small intestine. Now, they're gonna enter the bloodstream and they're gonna come right over here to the stomach and they're gonna do the same thing that this gastrin does. They're gonna <coughs> activate gastric glands. And so the point of that is, as we start to get a little bit of chyme moving over here into the small intestine, that first little bit that comes in, it's a signal saying, hey, release this intestinal gastrin, tell that stomach, ramp up those secretions so we can finish digestion in the stomach and then move on. Now, as more and more chyme moves over here into the small intestine, then we're gonna to start to inhibit activity in the stomach. So the point of that is, as we have more and more chyme here in the small intestine, and the small intestine starts to stretch, then we're gonna start releasing a different group of hormones. So now we're gonna start releasing, the small intestine will start to release secretin and CCK and a variety of other hormones. And those hormones are going to enter the bloodstream and they're going to have lots of different effects. Right now we're going to talk about one effect and that is they'll come to the stomach and they will inhibit gastric secretions. Now the point of that is this gastrin initially is telling the stomach ramp up those secretions and let's finish digestion in the stomach. As we get more and more time moving into the small intestine, then we want to say, hey, stomach, you're done. Let's start slowing down the secretions in the stomach. And now we want to start ramping up secretions in the small intestine because we're moving that material forward. So a lot of people get confused by this. The intestinal phase is very, you have this very brief initial effect where gastrin is released and it get, ramps up gastric secretions. The latter part of that phase is to release different hormones, secretin and CCK, that inhibit gastric secretions because by that point, really all the material or the material is starting, the chyme is starting to come to the small intestine and we're basically starting to slow down gastric secretions because we're moving everything forward at this point. 
question. Yeah. So at that point, would your brain start to think, oh, I'm full? That will happen. Usually that happens before, um, before this. This can take hours to get to this point. Um, well, maybe not necessarily hours. But about 20 minutes after you eat, you start to get the signals saying you're full. So it could be happening at the same time, but it's not going to be due to these particular hormones. You're going to have different hormones being released and different reflexes that are telling you, hey, you're, you're getting full at this point. And this is one of the reasons they always say eat slow because your brain doesn't register that you're full until about 20 minutes after you've eaten. And so a lot of people, if they eat fast, they're going to overeat because they're still feeling hungry. And really, they're going to be completely full um, before their brain ever registers that they are. So different reflexes telling the brain, hey, you're full. But it would be happening, could be happening during that period of time. Could be. Depends on how fast. Actually, I take that back. I take that back, Dennis. Because if this is lasting several hours, then if you put food into your mouth, right, this phase is lasting several hours, so you're going to be told that you're hungry while you're in this phase here. While you're digesting the food that's in the stomach, you're going to be told that you're hungry. So this is not going to happen until like five hours after you've put food in your mouth. Yeah, so being told that you're hungry is going to happen up here. But again, not these reflexes, different reflexes are telling your brain that. <coughs> okay. So we talked about motility, getting the food out of the stomach and into the small intestine. We talked about this already. So we're going to have peristaltic waves that are set up and you're going to have pacemaker cells in the smooth muscle of the muscularis externa tunic, kind of like the pacemaker cells that you saw in the um, heart, similar to that. Not exactly the same, but similar. And these cells are setting a pace for the contractions of those smooth muscles. Now, the more food that's in your stomach, then we can have neuronal and hormonal mechanisms, basically the same ones that we just looked at, increasing how fast these cells are contracting. So the same stimuli, the same mechanisms that increase gastric secretions are going to increase these, the contraction of these cells. So pyloric valve acts as a filter, make sure that particles are small enough because once we get into the small intestine, we're going to be finishing chemical digestion. We don't want to be worrying about mechanical digestion anymore. That we want to finish in the stomach. And again, the stomach is set up to do that really well because it has three layers of smooth muscle and muscularis externa, so we can get really good segmentation happening. Now, one thing to keep in mind is that pyloric sphincter or that pyloric valve, it never completely opens. It's always partially closed and that's because it acts as a filter. So you don't want it to ever be um, completely open because then large particles of food would be able to get through and you want it to act like a filter so it's always going to be partially contracted. All right. And we talked about um, emptying the stomach. So we said about four hours. Um, Again, if it's a very fat, heavy meal, then we might be going up more into six hours, seven hours of that food being in the stomach. Obviously, if you're eating a meal that's just liquids, it's going to go through much faster because you don't have to worry about all this mechanical digestion. Things are already going to be in liquid form. Okay, so over to the small intestine. So, small intestine is going to be the major digestive organ because this is where we're going to finish all of our chemical digestion. So that means we're going to finish carbohydrate digestion that we started where? 
in the mouth. We're going to finish <coughs> protein digestion that we started where? In the stomach. And we're going to start and complete all of our fat digestion. And once we get all of those macromolecules digested, then we have to absorb all the nutrients. So that's all taking place in the small intestine. So we're going to be absorbing the monosaccharides, the amino acids, the fatty acids, and glycerols. And we're going to get secretions coming primarily, not from the small intestine itself, but primarily from the liver and the pancreas. So most of the enzymes that are going to be involved in this chemical digestion, very few are actually going to come from the small intestine. They're going to come from the pancreas, and then from the liver, we're going to get bile. We'll talk about what bile is. Now, when you look at the small intestine, the small intestine is actually longer than the large intestine. The reason it's called the small intestine is because the diameter is smaller than the large intestine is. But in terms of length, it's longer. Now, when you look at the small intestine, I don't think I have an image. No, I don't. So the small intestine is going to run from the pyloric sphincter, which separates the first part of the small intestine from the stomach, over to the ileocecal valve. And the small intestine has three parts. First part is the duodenum, middle part is the jejunum, last part is the ileum. And then we're going to go into the large intestine. And the first part of the large intestine is called the cecum. So that's why this is called the ileocecal valve. It's the valve or the sphincter in between the last part of the small intestine, the ileum, and the first part of the large intestine, the cecum. Now, coming into the duodenum, we're going to have ducts coming into the duodenum. We're going to have the bile duct coming in, and we're going to have the pancreatic duct coming in. And that's going to bring secretions from the pancreas. It's going to bring secretions from the liver and or the gallbladder are going to come in through the bile duct. Now, when we look at these ducts, let's just look at these for a second. So what we're looking at right here, this is the first part of the small intestine, which is the duodenum. This is the pancreas right here. So the stomach would be right here, right, connected to the duodenum. And then here we have the gallbladder, and the gallbladder is sitting in a recess of the liver. So the liver would be all up around in here. And they've just moved the liver so we can see these ducts better. So coming into the duodenum, we're going to get chyme coming from the pyloric region of the stomach into the duodenum, going through the pyloric valve. Coming from the pancreas, we're going to have a variety of pancreatic enzymes as well as pancreatic secretions, juices, that are coming in through the pancreatic duct. And then, at the liver is where we're going to make bile. Now, bile is going to leave the liver through the right and left hepatic ducts. Okay? So bile is made in the liver. It leaves the liver through the right and left hepatic ducts. Now, the right and left hepatic ducts, they merge to form the common hepatic duct. Now, most of the time, bile is not going to actually come straight to the duodenum. It's actually going to go to the gallbladder and get concentrated and stored there until we need it. So, bile's made up here in the liver, leaves through the right and left hepatic ducts. They merge to form the common hepatic duct. And then the bile will come up here through the cystic duct and into the gallbladder and get concentrated and stored. And then when the gallbladder contracts, and we'll talk about how it contracts, why it contracts, but when the gallbladder contracts, the bile then will leave the gallbladder, go through the cystic duct, and you can see here the cystic duct and the common hepatic duct form the bile duct or sometimes you'll see it called the common bile duct. So 
So bile leaves the gallbladder, goes through the cystic duct, comes into the bile duct, and goes right into the small intestine, the duodenum. This may be getting ahead of it, and if it is, just tell me. Mm -hmm. But is the bile going to the gallbladder a necessary step? Because It is not a necessary step. Because I was thinking a lot of people have to have their gallbladder right. removed. Right, yeah. so it's I'm not just... necessary. Okay. Yeah. And we'll talk a little bit more about what bile is and what the gallbladder does. and okay. yeah. So we'll talk about that in a second. But no, it's not necessary. But normally, if everything's intact, then it is going to go to the gallbladder because it'll be concentrated there and then get stored. Shall I? Okay. Okay. All right. Okay. So those are the different ducts. So definitely make sure you're comfortable with how the hepatic ducts form the common hepatic duct and how the common hepatic merges with the cystic to form the bile duct. Okay. Just make sure you're comfortable with that. Okay. So let's talk about the small intestine. So we said in the small intestine, we're going to be finishing chemical digestion and we're going to be doing all of our absorption. So now we want to think what kind of adaptations are we going to have at our tunics to allow this to occur. So the major thing in the small intestine is we want to increase surface area. That's going to be the key thing that we want to do because that's going to allow us to absorb these nutrients really quickly. Because remember, that chyme is moving through the GI tract. It's not just going to stop and hang out there and allow digestion to finish and absorption to happen. Everything's moving slowly, but it's moving. So we need to be finishing the digestion, chemical digestion, and then doing the absorption before that chyme leaves the small intestine, and then we don't have a chance to absorb it anymore. And this is one of the problems when you have diarrhea, right? Things are moving through the GI tract too quickly. And so not only can you become dehydrated because you're losing so much water, but you can start to not get enough nutrients because you don't have the time to absorb those nutrients. So everything in the small intestine is going to be about, I shouldn't say everything, most of what's happening in the small intestine is about increasing surface area. So you're going to have what's called the plique circularis. So this is where, if you look at the mucosa and submucosal tunics, instead of them being straight, they're going to be organized into these deep circular folds. So when you look inside the small intestine, the inner part of it isn't smooth and straight. It's going to have these deep circular folds, plique circularis. And what this does is, obviously it increases surface area and by having these circular folds it's going to cause the chyme instead of going straight through the small intestine the chyme is going to be going down through these folds it's going to spiral around and that's going to slow down the movement and allow for that digestion to finish and then absorption to happen then if you look at the mucosa tunic so we're going to see simple columnar epithelia, but instead of it being straight, it's going to be organized into what are called villi. So instead of having a straight mucosa of simple columnar epithelial cells, like this, it's going to be organized into what are called villi. So you're going to have these finger-like projections, like this. And then down here will be your simple columnar epithelial cells. Okay, those will continue. Yes. So in the stomach, we had gastric pits. We had the surface and then pits, like this. And in the small intestine, we're going to have villi extensions. And again, the point of this is going from this to this, we're going to increase surface area greatly. So those are the villi. Then if you look at the apical surface of these epithelial cells, they will increase their surface area by putting extensions called microvilli, right? We've talked about these before. So in here we'll have microvilli. 
all on the apical surface of those epithelial cells. And again, that will increase the surface area. Now, also in these microvilli, embedded in the plasma membrane in the microvilli, you're going to find enzymes in there. And they're called brush border enzymes. And these enzymes are going to be enzymes that the small intestine is producing that help to break down proteins and carbohydrates. So we said most of the enzymes that are active in the small intestine don't come from the small intestine. They're coming from the pancreas. Here are some enzymes that are active in the small intestine, these brush border enzymes. But you can see they are membrane bound. They're not going to be floating around in the lumen like the other enzymes that come from the pancreas. They're membrane bound, so that means that the food, the chyme that's in the lumen, has to interact with the enzymes that are membrane bound here in the microvilli, these brush border enzymes. So all three of these structural adaptations that increase the surface area to allow for better chemical digestion and increased efficiency of absorption. Okay, and so here you can see the inside plica circularis. These would be the villi right here sticking up. If we look at the epithelial cells here, we can see that they have microvilli on their surface. Now, these villi, let's just look at these here for a second. Another important thing about these villi, in addition to the fact that they increase surface area, is right in the middle of these villi, so in this part right here, this is where you're going to find blood vessels and nerves and lacteals, a special lymphatic vessel. So what's going to happen is when we go to absorb nutrients, anything that's water soluble, so that would be amino acids, that would be your monosaccharides like glucose, and then also things like water soluble vitamins and minerals, sodium, potassium, magnesium. When those products get absorbed here, they're going to get absorbed across the wall of the small intestine. So they're going to be transported across the apical surface of these epithelial cells. They'll get transported across the basal surface of those epithelial cells. And then they'll be here in this extracellular environment, and then they'll diffuse into these capillaries in here. And then they're part of the bloodstream. Things that are not water-soluble, your fat-soluble compounds, like your uh, fat-soluble um, vitamins and your fatty acids and glycerol, they will go through the plasma membrane of these um, epithelial cells, again, because they don't need to be transported, they'll just diffuse, and then they will come into these green structures, these lacteals, and they'll then become a part of the lymph. And here in the lymph, they'll get hooked up to various proteins, and <clears throat> they'll have special names, and eventually those lipids or those fatty acids cholesterol um, will be attached to these proteins, travel through the lymph, and eventually the lymph will drain back into the bloodstream. So they'll get to the bloodstream, they just have to travel through the lymph first. And so when you look at lymph, it's going to have a milky white appearance to it, and that's because there are generally a lot of fats in the lymph particularly if you've just eaten a meal recently, and particularly if it was a really fatty meal, your lymph will look very milky in appearance. Okay. Now, when we look at the um, tunics, okay, so we're looking at the mucosal tunic of the small intestine, we said that we're going to see simple columnar epithelia, and then we're also going to see a variety of cells um, interspersed within that epithelia. 
So we're going to see um, the epithelial cells will have a lot of tight junctions, like we saw over in the stomach. And again, that's going to be important to help keep anything, particularly the enzymes, from leaking down or leaking between the individual epithelial cells, getting down deeper into the wall of the small intestine. Conditions aren't as harsh as they are in the stomach, but we still have enzymes that are breaking down carbohydrates and proteins and fats, and you don't want your cells to be destroyed or the wall of the small intestine. So you're going to have tight junctions. You will have enteroendocrine cells here in the small intestine, like you did over in the stomach. And these guys secrete a variety of different hormones. I want you guys to know two hormones that come from the small intestine, secretin and CCK. Now, we also mentioned that there is intestinal gastrin. So, there are actually three hormones I want you to be familiar with. Intestinal gastrin, and we said that that is going to act on the stomach and increase gastric secretions. We also have secretin and CCK being released from the small intestine. And so far, we said that these two hormones can act at the stomach. And what do they do at the stomach? They do what? Decrease gastric secretions, decrease the gastric glands. Okay. We're going to see that these hormones also do other things. So we're going to come back and talk about these. They have several target sites. We're going to see that there are a lot of lymphatic cells embedded within the mucosal tunic. And again, that's to help keep anything that's made it through the digestive tract so far, made it past the stomach. We don't want any pathogens to get absorbed into the bloodstream here. Small intestine is set up to absorb material very efficiently. And we don't want any toxins, we don't want any pathogens getting into the bloodstream. Now, if they do, remember that we have a backup mechanism. We're going to send all of this blood, leaving these organs, over to the liver first to get detoxified before it enters the general circulation. Okay. We're also going to see intestinal crypts. So these are just groups of cells. Um, that are here within the epithelia, or sorry, within the mucosal tunic that secrete intestinal juice. Now, we're also going to see in the submucosa primarily, sometimes you'll see it in the mucosal tunic, but mostly in the submucosa, you're going to see these very distinctive structures. And one is called Peyer's patches, and these are great big lymphoid nodules, which is just they're kind of like your tonsils are lymphoid nodules. They're big groups of lymphoid tissue that are in the submucosa of the ileum. And these are how you're going to be able to tell when you're looking at the microscope. This is how you're going to be able to tell the ileum from the jejunum from the duodenum. If you see Peyer's patches, you know that you're looking at the ileum. Instead, if you see Bruner's glands, these little glands, little rings of simple cuboidal epithelia, classic gland, if you see these, then you know that you are in the duodenum. And if you don't see either of these in the submucosa, then you know you're looking at the jejunum. So that's going to be absolutely something that I ask you on the practical, no doubt about it. Now, what are these things for? So let's start with the Brunner's glands. Brunner's glands, what they do is they release an alkaline mucus. Okay? So think about this. As that chyme is coming from the stomach over into the duodenum, that chyme is very acidic, right? It's just leaving the stomach. pH is about 2. And as we come into the small intestine, we're going to start increasing secretions from the pancreas so that we can finish digesting our proteins in the small intestine, finish digesting our carbohydrates in the small intestine, and start and finish digesting fats. And all of the enzymes that are involved in doing that, all of these enzymes that are coming from the pancreas 
and these brush border enzymes that are membrane bound here in the small intestine. They are all active at a neutral pH. So if we just brought that acidic chyme over and we never changed the pH, none of those enzymes would be active and we wouldn't finish breaking down our various nutrients. So we're gonna have to have a variety of things that immediately neutralize that acidic chyme right away. And one thing is gonna be alkaline mucus that comes from Brunner's glands that are in the submucosa of the duodenum. Now, over here in the ileum, in the ileum we have Peyer's patches, big groups of lymphoid material. Now, what we're gonna see is in the large intestine, there are a lot of bacteria in the large intestine. And that bacteria is there for a reason. It makes various vitamins, it helps break down certain types of cellulose, certain types of fiber. And that bacteria is there, we want it there, it's good for us but we want it to stay in the large intestine. But these bacteria don't know, hey, this is the boundary between the large intestine and the small intestine. They don't know where that is. So if any of the bacteria in the large intestine, if they started creeping up and <coughs> ending up in the last part of the small intestine, the ileum, we want to kill them. We want to destroy them because we don't want them to enter into our bloodstream which the small intestine is geared to do really well. They're great in the large intestine, but they need to stay in the lumen. If they get into our bloodstream, we're gonna end up being septic. You can die from that very easily. So these pyre patches are there to help keep the bacteria from flourishing in the small intestine where they should not be. So we'll look at these again when we look at histology. Okay, now, intestinal juice. So this is the fluid that the small intestine is secreting. That's gonna mix with this acidic chyme that's coming from the stomach. Now, we're secreting a lot of it, about one to two liters per day, so that's a lot of fluid. So we already said that we've got about a liter of salivary, uh, of saliva, <coughs> We've got a lot of gastric secretions being released. Here we've got about one to two intestinal juice. And most of the water that's in these various secretions, we're gonna actually just absorb it, and that's gonna be part of keeping ourselves hydrated. We're just gonna absorb that water. Now, this intestinal juice, most of it's water, okay? It's gonna look pretty similar to blood plasma except it's not gonna have um, lots, it's not gonna have cells, obviously, in it. It's not gonna have a lot of plasma proteins. But other than that, it's gonna look real similar to blood plasma. It's gonna be slightly alkaline, and again, that should make sense because we've got to neutralize that acidic chyme that's coming from the stomach. Um, remember that the enzymes that are active in the small intestine they're not gonna be secreted from the small intestine. Those enzymes are coming from the pancreas, primarily. The small intestine, the enzymes that it is contributing are membrane bound. They would not be in this intestinal juice. So this intestinal juice by itself is very <coughs> enzyme poor. Okay? It's gotta mix with secretions coming from the pancreas. So what we want to do now is we want to talk about the accessory organs, the pancreas and the liver, that are helping the small intestine do its job. So we'll start with the liver. Liver is referred to as being the largest gland. It's a digestive gland. It is a metabolic gland. Um, it's secreting, obviously, exocrine products, not hormones, but exocrine products. Um, it has four different lobes to it, right to left, which are the two largest. Then you have the caudate and the quadrate. And then the gallbladder is going to sit on the inferior surface in a little groove, inferior surface of the right lobe. Now, um, you can see when you look at an adult liver, 
you can see the remnant of the fetal umbilical vein. So the liver is right here, right? Your belly button is right down here, which is where your umbilical cord was. And so you're going to see the remnant of the fetal umbilical vein that would have been you know, associated right there. You're gonna see that running right along the border between the right and left lobes of the liver. And that remnant of the fetal umbilical vein is called the ligamentum teres. Now, you're also gonna see a piece of mesentery, right, connective tissue separating the right and left lobes of the liver on the anterior side. And it'll be real distinctive, and that's called your falciform ligament. And what this piece of mesentery does is it's connecting the liver to the diaphragm. So it's connecting the anterior part of the liver to the diaphragm and to the anterior abdominal wall. So it helps to hold it into place. And again, running right alongside this piece of mesentery is the remnant of that fetal umbilical vein. Is the, so if it's right and left, quadrate and quadrate, are they? They're kind of underneath. They're on the inferior and slightly posterior side. They're kind of little slivers. It's okay. best to look at a model because then you can see the, you can see them distinctly. Gotcha. Okay, so the liver. The liver is where we're going to produce bile. And again, that bile is generally going to go to the gallbladder and get stored. And we already talked about the ducts, so we're good with the ducts. What we want to do is look at how the liver is organized. So if you look at the liver, it's organized into these small structures called lobules. And lobules would be the smallest functional unit of the liver. So just like when we talk about an organism, smallest functional unit is a cell. When we talked about compact bone, smallest functional unit was a what? Starts with an O. Osteon. The smallest functional unit of skeletal muscle is? Myocardial. Sarcomere. Sarcomere. Yeah, sarcomere. Of <laughs> Okay, so smallest functional unit of the liver is a liver lobule. And a liver lobule is a hexagonal structure. And right in the middle of this lobule, it's going to be a vein called the central vein. And then at each of these points of that hexagonal liver lobule, you're going to have three vessels. And those three vessels together are called your portal triad. This is your portal triad. And the three vessels here, you have a hepatic arterial, you have a hepatic portal venule, and then you have a bile duct. So at each of those points, you have these three vessels. Now, in the lobule itself, you're going to have a lot of hepatocytes, liver cells. Lots of liver cells in here. And you're also going to have what are called liver sinusoids, which are just large, leaky capillaries. So, and here you're going to have liver sinusoids.
So what we want to look at is we want to say, how is blood coming in and supplying these hepatocytes with oxygen and nutrients? Okay. And then we want to say, how is bile being produced in these hepatocytes and going into the bile ducts? And then we have to think the liver is also receiving blood from another place, from the hepatic portal vein. And that blood is coming in to get detoxified. So there's a few different things happening here in the liver. So first of all, these hepatocytes, one of their jobs is they make bile. So when these hepatocytes make bile, the bile is going to flow out towards the bile ducts. So bile is being made by the hepatocytes and then it's flowing out towards these portal triads to drain into the bile ducts. And these bile ducts will then eventually drain into either the right or the left hepatic ducts and that's how bile leaves the liver and then that bile will flow into the common hepatic duct. And then from there, it will go into the cystic duct and then go to the gallbladder. So all of these little bile ducts at every portal triad and every liver lobule will all eventually drain into the right or left hepatic duct. And that's how bile leaves the liver. Cystic duct gallbladder. Now, we want to look at blood flowing into these liver lobules. <coughs> now, blood is going to be flowing the opposite direction from bile. So, blood's going to come in at the portal triads and then come in to capillaries and supply these cells or come in to the liver lobules so that we can detoxify that blood. And then all that blood will go into the central vein. <coughs> and from the central vein, the central veins will all drain into larger but less numerous veins and then lead the liver through the hepatic vein drain into the inferior vena cava, then back to the heart. Okay, so let's look at blood flowing through the liver. So we said that the liver we've got blood coming in through the hepatic artery. That blood branched off of the abdominal aorta. So that is oxygen rich, nutrient rich blood that's coming into the liver. Now that hepatic artery is going to branch into smaller and more numerous arteries that we're not going to name until eventually it gets down to hepatic arterioles. And there's one at every corner of every single liver lobule. Blood's coming in, and it's branching till we get blood into each of these hepatic arterioles, one at each of the portal triads of every liver lobule. And then that blood will go into capillary beds. 
and that's going to supply all of these hepatocytes. Right. So we're not showing it here, but there would be capillaries, and then we would have gas and nutrient exchange and fluid exchange. So that all these hepatocytes are getting oxygen, they're getting nutrients, they're get rid of, getting rid of CO2, they're get rid of, uh, getting rid of waste, so on and so forth. And then that blood, as it leaves the capillaries, it will then drain into venules that we're not showing here. Not these venules, different venules. And then those venules will eventually drain into the central vein. Okay, right here. And that's how blood that came into this liver lobule is going to leave this liver lobule through the central vein. And then central veins from all these different liver lobules are going to drain ultimately into other veins that we're not identifying. And as blood leaves the liver, it's going to leave through the hepatic vein. And then the hepatic vein will go into the inferior vena cava, and that will go back to the heart. Now, so that blood is coming in through these portal triads and in towards the central vein so that all those hepatocytes can get their nutrients in blood. Now we said the liver also receives blood from another structure. So blood that leaves the digestive organs. <coughs> blood that leaves digestive organs is going to all drain into the hepatic portal vein. portal veins going to come into the liver as well. Now, blood that's in this hepatic portal vein, let's say that we just ate a meal. Okay? Is this blood going to be oxygen rich or oxygen poor blood? Oxygen poor because it's venous blood. If we just ate a meal, is it going to be nutrient rich? Yeah, probably going to be nutrient rich because we are absorbing those nutrients across the wall of the small intestine. And maybe there's some toxins in there that were able to make it through the GI system and actually enter the bloodstream. So now this blood is going to stay in its own blood vessels. It's not going to mix with this blood up here. Okay? Until we hit the central vein, <coughs> then the blood mixes together. But this blood stays in its own vessels. It's going to come into these liver lobules, and it's going to branch until we get down to the level of a hepatic portal venule. So hepatic portal vein comes into the liver. It's going to branch, and it's going to bring in blood to every liver lobule through a hepatic portal venule, one at each of these corners, just like we just talked about, but for the hepatic arterial. Same kind of thing happening. And then that blood, again, stays in its own vessels. And instead of going into regular capillaries, it goes into these nice, enlarged, leaky capillaries called liver sinus. And these sinusoids are nice, big, leaky capillaries. And what that does is it allows your <coughs> immune system to be able to kind of look in there and see, is there anything in there that shouldn't be in there? Macrophages can get at that blood. Macrophages that live in your liver, they can go into these sinusoids or Whatever's in the sinusoids, let's say a pathogen or toxins, they can diffuse out of those capillaries because they're nice and big and leaky, 
And then macrophages or other white blood cells can look and say, oh, that shouldn't be here, and go engulf it and get rid of it. Okay. And there's other things that happen too in the process of detoxifying this blood. Okay. I'm not going to go into all the details. There are a variety of different cells, there's a variety of different enzymes that are looking for things like drugs and breaking drugs down, breaking down the Tylenol that you took, breaking down alcohol that you drank. Okay. So, this is why if you take too much Tylenol, Tylenol is really rough on your liver. If you take Tylenol consistently over long periods of time, you can damage these cells because those chemicals, those drugs that are diffusing out of the sinusoids, they're rough on these cells here. So things are getting detoxified here. We're breaking down drugs, we're breaking down alcohol, breaking down pharmaceuticals. We are also screening anything that got absorbed in the small, in the GI system. Anything that entered in our mouth and potentially could have gotten absorbed, we're gonna screen it and detoxify it. And the liver also does other things. It'll say, hmm, I see some glucose there. I'm gonna take that glucose and store it away as glycogen before the rest of the body can get it. I'm gonna store that away in case the neurons need it later. So there are other things that are happening there. There are lots of things that are happening. The key thing that I want you guys to know is how that blood is flowing in and that it stays in separate vessels. Now, as blood leaves these large leaky capillaries, now it will go into venules and those venules will converge into the central vein. And it's at the central vein here <clears throat> blood's going to leave this liver lobule, blood that came in through the hepatic arterioles and blood that came in through the hepatic portal venules. It's all going to leave the lobules through the central vein. So all that blood mixes together now. And then that blood then will go through veins and then leaves the liver through the hepatic vein, then into the inferior vena cava, and now all of that nice, clean, nutrient-rich blood from the meal that we just ate is now part of the general circulation. It goes back to the heart so that we can send it over to the lungs to pick up oxygen, get rid of our CO2, send it back over to the heart, out through the aorta, and then all cells will have access to that nice, clean, nutrient-rich blood. Okay, okay. questions on that? Yeah. I just can't see um, the word between the cat beds and the venule on the top part of the diagram. Supplies hepatocytes. Okay, thank you. So the blood here is supplying those hepatocytes with oxygen and nutrients. And the blood down here is getting detoxified. So that's a key difference between that blood. The arterial blood is supplying the cells of the liver and then the blood from the hepatic portal venule is getting detoxified. And once it does that, then all of that venous blood will just merge together through the central vein, hepatic vein, inferior vena cava, and now it's just normal venous blood again. So, key thing when you look at these lobules, bile flows inward out, blood flows out towards the central vein, inward. Okay, so the fluids are flowing in separate directions. Now, I do ask you to know about the liver lobules and all of these structures that we just talked about and the blood flow that we just talked about. But there are no models. So I will ask you all of this with words. Okay? So I might say, blood that is oxygen rich, and nutrient rich comes into the liver lobules through the what vessel? Hepatic arterial. Okay. Blood that leaves the liver lobules exits through what vessel? Central vein. Okay. 
um, I may say, um, I may say, a portal triad has what three vessels there? And you need to list the three vessels that would be there. Okay. Know this stuff. So you see it on the lecture exam, you'll also see it on the Now, the liver also, I said liver is going to do lots of things. It's going to produce bile. It's going to process blood-borne nutrients. So like taking glucose out and storing it as glycogen, it can store fat-soluble vitamins here. Um, it can do detoxification. The liver does amazing things in terms of metabolism and nutrients. The liver can basically take lots of things that you give it and it can turn it into glucose. It can take uh, fats and turn them into glucose. It can take lactic acid and turn it into glucose. The liver can do all of these great chemical reactions because the liver has lots of different enzymes that most cells don't have. So the liver is going to be the place, and we talked about this with endocrine, the liver is going to be the place where it is kind of a factory. It can make fats. It can make different amino acids. It can make glucose from lots of different starting materials and then release those things to the blood so that all cells have access to it because cells can't do that themselves. So if you are short on a particular type of amino acid, in many cases, not always, the liver can take other amino acids and then turn it into the one that you need. No, not always, but often. It does things like that. Okay, now bile. What is bile? And <clears throat> bile is <clears throat> composed of a variety of different things. First of all, it's going to be alkaline in nature. Um, not excessively, but slightly alkaline. It's going to have bile salts in there, bile pigments, which give it this yellow-greenish color. Um, there's cholesterol and bile. There are various fats, phospholipids, electrolytes. There's a lot of different things in bile. And what bile is primarily used for, kind of two things. One, it helps to solubilize cholesterol. Remember, cholesterol is lipid soluble, it's not water soluble. So it's going to help to solubilize cholesterol. And remember, all cells need cholesterol. Cholesterol is not this horrible thing that we always think about. You don't want to have too much cholesterol. You want to have a certain type of cholesterol compared to another. But cholesterol is a thing that you need. Cholesterol is also how you make testosterone. It's how you make estrogen. So it's absolutely critical for the body. Bile is necessary in order to absorb fats and cholesterol and phospholipids and any kind of lipid. Bile needs to be present, needs to be in the small intestine. And the other thing that it does is it emulsifies fats. So bile is not an enzyme. It does not cleave bonds. What bile does, what emulsify means is, when you get fats in the small intestine, and remember, we haven't started breaking down our lipids yet. They're coming down to the small intestine as just great big lipid droplets. They're not water soluble. So what we have to do in order for the lipases to get in there and cleave the bonds, we have to take this great big fat droplet and break it down into a bunch of small droplets. Just like what we had to do for the food. We had to take big pieces of food and break them down into real little pieces so the enzymes could get in there and cleave the bonds that were holding the amino acids together and the monosaccharides together. That's what bile does. It takes a great big fat droplet and breaks it down into a bunch of little fat droplets. And then the lipases can get in there and cleave the bonds and yield fatty acids and glycerol. And then with bile present, we can absorb those things into the lacteals, or in through the lacteals, and in the lymph. So that's the main thing that it's doing. And remember, the key pigment 
of bile is bilirubin. And remember where that came from. That came from breaking down our red blood cells. When we break down our red blood cells, we have to break down hemoglobin. Globin is just a protein. Break that down into amino acids. The heme part of hemoglobin gets <coughs> converted into bilirubin. And bilirubin is a key component of our bile. Now, what causes the liver to make and release bile? That's going to be secretin, that hormone that we talked about. We said that when that acidic kind comes into the duodenum, after we get a certain amount of that kind coming into the duodenum, the duodenum stretches, and that causes the small intestine to release secretin and CCK. We said secretin and CCK entered the bloodstream, went to the stomach, decreased gastric secretions. Secretin also enters the bloodstream, comes over to the liver and tells the liver, hey, make bile. So bile is made primarily when we have chyme in the small intestine. That's when we make the bile, primarily. Yeah. Um, when you go get like blood drawn or something, uh, one of the things that, like if I've gotten my blood drawn, I see that they've checked my bilirubin. Mm -hmm. Why would they do that? What are they looking for? Maybe covered and I missed it, but so when they're looking for bilirubin, they're looking. They can see a couple things from that. Um, primarily, when they look for bilirubin, they're looking to see is your liver um, is your liver active within the normal range. So, since bilirubin is a component of bile and the liver is making bile, <coughs> if the liver's not working right, then your bile, your bile numbers will be off and your bilirubin numbers will be off. So it's a test of saying, is the liver working properly or not? Okay. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now the gallbladder, again, is where we store this bile. So we're going to store it and we're going to concentrate it. And basically, by concentrating, what we mean is we're just going to take water and absorb some of that water and ions and make that bile more concentrated. When secretin and CCK go over to the gallbladder, the gallbladder will contract, and that will release the bile that was stored. So, so far, we've seen secretin and CCK go to the stomach and inhibit gastric secretions. We saw that secretin goes over to the liver and stimulates bile production from hepatocytes. Secretin and CCK go to the gallbladder, cause it to contract. So again, all of these things are happening when we have material in the small intestine, which again should make sense. If we have material in the small intestine, we want to decrease what's going on in the stomach and increase all the places that are going to send secretions to the small intestine, the pancreas, the liver, the gallbladder. Okay. Um, now, if that chyme happens to be particularly fatty, then that will cause CCK and secretin levels to really kind of ramp up, and that will cause the gallbladder to contract really strongly. Now, we can also have neural stimulation activating the gallbladder, but most of the activity of the gallbladder is through secretin and CCK, through hormones. And again, if you kind of back up and think about it, that should make sense. So far, when we've talked about a strong vagal stimulation, strong vagal stimulation caused our salivary glands to release their secretions and cause the gastric glands to release their secretions. If a strong vagal stimulation also cause the gallbladder to release secretions, then we've got secretions going in too many different digestive organs all at once. We've got the mouth with saliva, we've got the stomach with gastric secretions, now we've got the small intestine with bile. Instead, 
the vagus nerve is going to really kind of ramp up saliva and gastric secretions, and then we rely on hormones to really kind of ramp up what's going on in the small intestine so that we don't have too many things going on at once. We get things, kind of start to get them ready, but we want it to come in phases or cycles. We don't want everything active all at once. I'm going to skip over to the pancreas. Pancreas, this should be review. Okay? So remember the pancreas is both endocrine and exocrine. For the pancreas, the exocrine portion, which is now what we're going to talk mostly about, those are the acinar or the acini cells. And these are the cells that are releasing pancreatic juice. And in that pancreatic juice are going to be a variety of enzymes. Enzymes that are going to go to the small intestine and help to finish protein digestion help to finish carbohydrate digestion, and start and finish lipid digestion. Now remember the endocrine portion, those are the islets, and we've got alpha and beta cells in the islets. Alpha cells make glucagon, beta cells make insulin. Now, here in the pancreas, Okay, so again, we're looking at the ACE in our cells. We're looking at these as semi cells. And remember, these are exocrine cells, which means that they have a duct associated with them. So these would be our ACE in our cells here, and they're making and releasing various enzymes. Now, just go way back to first quarter. Enzymes are what kind of macromolecule? They're proteins. Okay. So if these cells are going to make enzymes that are going to go to the small intestine and break down proteins, carbs, and lipids, where are we going to make those enzymes? The rough endoplasmic reticulum, and then they're going to go over to what organelle next? Over to the Golgi apparatus. They're going to get modified, tagged, and bagged in the Golgi apparatus. Then they're going to be sent over here to this apical surface of the cell. They're going to be exocytosed, not into the extracellular environment, but right into this duct. And then they're going to travel through the duct, through this pancreatic duct, and they're going to end up on an epithelial surface, which is at the duodenum epithelial surface. Now, for some of these enzymes, the pancreas is not going to release the active form. So when we talked about pepsin in the stomach, the chief cells released a proenzyme, pepsinogen. And it wasn't until pepsinogen came in contact with HCL that we got the active form pepsin. <coughs> Similar thing happening in the pancreas. These acinar cells, they're releasing three proenzymes. They're releasing a lot. I'm going to ask you guys to know three proenzymes. So back here, what we just looked at, these cells are releasing three <coughs> proenzymes that are going to travel through the pancreatic duct and end up in the duodenum. And those three proenzymes are trypsinogen, chymone trypsinogen, and procarboxypeptidase. Now, we have to take those inactive forms and make them active, right? So how do we do that? Trypsinogen when it comes in contact with membrane-bound enteropeptidases, right? So what is that, right? Membrane-bound, what does that mean? Where are you going to find it? In the membrane, right? And when you look at the cells that line the small intestine, our brush border enzymes, which are membrane-bound enzymes, where were they located? In the, in the microvilla. Okay. And that's where these guys are. They're membrane bound. Entero means digestive, right? Peptidase means that it's involved in peptides. Yeah. 
So this would be a brush border enzyme found in the intestine that breaks down peptides or proteins. Okay? So this is just a brush border enzyme. Now, that by itself will break down proteins, help to digest proteins that are there in the small intestine. They also, these membrane-bound enteropeptidases, they also help to convert trypsinogen into trypsin. So they, trypsinogen in the presence of these brush border enzymes gets converted into the active form trypsin. Now trypsin is an active enzyme. It can go around and break down proteins, peptides, yield amino acids. Trypsin also, trypsin in the presence of chymotrypsinogen turns it into its active form, chymotrypsin. Procarboxypeptidase in the presence of trypsin gets converted to its active form, carboxypeptidase. So, what you want to do is know the inactive form than the active. Trypsinogen turns into trypsin. Chymotrypsinogen turns into chymotrypsin. Procarboxypeptidase turns into carboxypeptidase. What causes that conversion? Membrane-bound <coughs> enteropeptidases or brush border enzymes convert trypsinogen into trypsin. The other two get converted to their active form in the presence of trypsin. <coughs> and now that we have these three active enzymes, they can break down proteins. They will finish breaking down proteins and peptides so that we can absorb the amino acids. Now, we also are getting other things. Well, actually, let me back up for a second. Why? Why bother with all this? Why bother? sending off these pro-enzymes or these inactive enzymes. Why not just send trypsin, chymotrypsin, and carboxypeptidase through the pancreatic duct? Because I'll digest other proteins. They'll digest other proteins, right? And when you look at the membranes of cells, 55% of plasma membranes are proteins. So if these cells released trypsin, chymotrypsin, carboxypeptidase, they would destroy all the cells in their wake on the way to the small intestine. So we've got to get them inactive and then make them active once they're where we want them to be. Now, again, the pancreas is releasing a lot of other things. It releases pancreatic juice. And pancreatic juice is going to be mostly water. It's going to be on the alkaline side of things, and that's going to help to neutralize that acidic chyme that's coming from the stomach. It's also because there are bicarbonate ions in there, and this is what makes it slightly alkaline, the bicarbonate. That's going to set up just the right pH for these pancreatic enzymes. So. We said that pepsin is active at a very low pH, pH of 2. All these enzymes that we have just talked about, trypsin, carboxypeptidase, they're going to be the most active at a neutral to slightly alkaline pH. And that's what this pancreatic juice is doing, making sure that pH is just right. Now, also, we're going to release some other enzymes in this pancreatic juice. We're going to have pancreatic amylases in here. And what are pancreatic amylases going to break down? Carbs. Carbs, starches. So whatever didn't get chemically digested in the mouth with the salivary amylase, the pancreatic amylase can break it down. We're going to have pancreatic lipases that are going to break down fats. We're going to have pancreatic nucleases that are breaking down nucleic acids. Like what? What's a nucleic acid? DNA. DNA, RNA, right? So when you eat animals, when you eat plants, those cells have nuclei, right? And in the nucleus is DNA. So you've got to break that down. And then your body will use those components, right? Use them. So 
and these enzymes here, they're going to require just this right ion concentration with these bicarbonate ions and bile. So bile being present plus the ions in this pancreatic juice are going to make these enzymes just perfect. So they are working at optimal capacity. Now, John mentioned what happens if you don't have a gallbladder, right? And if you don't have a gallbladder, and sometimes the gallbladder has to be removed, you will still make and release bile. The problem is that it might be, it's going to take a little bit longer because you've got to wait for it to be made and then come straight from the liver to the small intestine as opposed to making it and then storing it and when you need it, just releasing the stored bile. So you're going to have to wait a little while. It's going to slow down your digestion a little bit. And it's not going to be as concentrated. These ionic concentrations are going to be slightly off. So people that don't have a gallbladder or people that have a lot of liver problems and they're not making bile appropriately, then they have to be careful with what they're eating and how much of it they're eating, particularly fats because bile is primarily emulsifier, you have to be really careful with how much fat you have in your diet and what kind of fat. So you can still do it, you just have to be kind of careful with it. Your enzymes may not be perfect optimal activity, so again, you need to make sure that you're eating kind of well, making sure you're getting the most bang for your buck, digesting as well as you can, and watching how much fat that you're now, what causes the pancreas to release its secretions? Same thing that we talked about, right? It's going to be both neuronal and hormonal mechanisms. So you've got acidic chyme coming into the duodenum. That's going to cause those enteroendocrine cells to release secretin and CCK. The wall is stretching, activating stretch receptors that then causes secretin CCK to be released. <coughs> secretin and CCK then enter into the bloodstream. We said they're gonna go to the stomach, they're gonna decrease gastric secretions, they're gonna go to the liver, <coughs> particularly secretin. It's gonna increase bile production. It's gonna go to the gallbladder, cause it to contract, release bile. Go to the pancreas, cause those acinar cells to make and release pancreatic juice, with, which is very enzyme rich with all these enzymes that we talked about. Also, vagal stimulation weakly will stimulate the pancreas as well. Weakly stimulates the gallbladder, weakly stimulates the pancreas. Most of it's hormonally driven. Once we get material in the small intestine, release those hormones, ramp up those secretions quickly. Okay, let's just see. Let me find a good spot to stop here. Okay. Okay, so we talked about all of this. Okay. Again, let me just emphasize here that nutrient absorption takes place in the small intestine. And when I say virtually all nutrient absorption, what this means is monosaccharides get absorbed in the small intestine. Amino acids get absorbed in the small intestine. Fatty acids and glycerol get absorbed in the small intestine. Then most of your ions, sodium, potassium, calcium, magnesium, most of those get absorbed in the small intestine. They can also get absorbed in the large intestine. Most of your water gets absorbed in the small intestine, but it can also get absorbed in the large intestine. Your <coughs> vitamins, most get absorbed in the small, but they can also get absorbed in the large. What is exclusively small? Monosaccharides, amino acids, fatty acids, and glycerol. Okay. And then most of the others. In terms of peristalsis, same general thing like what we saw in the stomach, 
you've got these basic pacemaker cells, Cajal cells, that are setting up these peristaltic contractions. As material comes into a particular area, into the small intestine, then you can increase the intensity of those contractions. And that's good enough to know. Okay. Now, don't worry about what kind of neurons. Okay? I'm not going to ask you about that. I do want you to have a sense of that in addition to the smooth muscle just having this base firing pattern, you also have various reflexes that will get set up that help to kind of speed things along a particular area, increase motility. And there are many of these reflexes. I have one here, and we'll mention one a little bit later. But you have what's called the gastroiliac reflex. And this is a long reflex. And again, you're going to have several of these, and we'll talk about more later. But what this is doing, Gastro means that the initial stimuli is going to happen in the stomach. So when food enters into the stomach, okay, that's actually going to set up a reflex that's going to cause nerves to go down to the ileal region and cause it to contract. And what that's going to do is you're sitting down, you're eating, let's say, meal number, meal one, right? You're eating meal one then several hours go by and that meal has moved down past your stomach into your small intestine, let's say. Okay? And then let's say 12 hours later, eight hours later, whatever, you eat your second meal. Okay? And when that second meal hits the stomach, then that's gonna set up a reflex that's gonna cause the ileum of the small intestine to start contracting and it's gonna cause the ileocecal valve to open. And what that's gonna do is that previous meal that hopefully is in the small intestine at this point, it's gonna move it into the large intestine. It's gonna move it out of the small into the large. So that this meal that we're eating right now, once we digest it four hours later from the stomach, it can then move into the small intestine. If we didn't have these reflexes, then things would start to get backed up and that food would end up staying in the stomach for too long. In addition to a neuronal reflex being set up, when gastrin is released, when we say gastrin is released when you have food in your stomach, gastrin will be released, enters the bloodstream, and it tells the stomach ramp up secretions. Gastrin also will enter the bloodstream and go down to the ileocecal area, cause that sphincter to open, cause the smooth muscle to relax at the sphincter, cause the smooth muscle of the ileum to start contracting, and that will also help to move previous food, previous material, chyme, I guess at that point, into the large intestine. And again, you've got lots of these different reflexes that are targeting different areas, but this just happens to be one. Can I just ask a quick question? Mm -hmm. um, the, like, people who say that it's, be like nutritionists and dietitians and stuff that say it's better to eat, like, five meals, mm -hmm. s smaller meals throughout the day rather than three meals, does that have to do with the digestive, digestive process, or is there another reason why they tell you to do that? It, no, it has to do with the digestive process, and generally the thought is that if you eat five small, the, kind of the goal behind it is, kind of two goals behind it. You want to make sure that you're eating enough, and this is where having high fiber in your diet comes into play. You want to make sure that you're eating enough and what you're consuming is bulky like fiber so that when that material gets into particularly the large intestine it is big and that causes the smooth muscle let's say of the large intestine or the small intestine to stretch and we've seen several situations where when muscle is stretched its inherent property is to contract and so that helps with motility it helps okay. move things along 
Now the problem is if you're eating really small meals, then they may not be big enough to expand. So if you eat small meals but often, then you basically have enough material in there to help with the expansion and then inherent contraction. The more important thing to that is trying to keep your insulin levels constant, keeping them from bottoming out or spiking, which is basically by keeping your glucose levels constant. So the problem with eating three meals a day and no snacks is that you will go through periods of time, and depending on what you ate, you will go through periods of time when your glucose levels become really low, and so then you have to release glucagon, and that then causes the liver to release glucose, and then you have this glucose spike, and then insulin's released, and you have an insulin spike, and so you start spiking. So if you're going to eat three meals a day, you really should have two snacks in there, too. What you're trying to do is keep those glucose levels constant. And the reason that you're doing that is it keeps the hormone levels from skyrocketing. And when your glucose levels go too high or too low, they start to change the osmotic concentration. And so you start to get in a situation where your blood plasma is not isotonic to the cells. And then that can cause fluid shifts. And that's not good for anything. And then your pH starts to get all wonky. <coughs> so it, I think the main reason five small meals is to keep glucose levels constant. That's the main reason. The problem is it's hard to eat that often. Yeah. That's the big challenge. And the other problem is people's definition of small is widely different. So nowadays we're so used to meals being so large that when you think of a small meal, it's actually a normal size meal. Mm -hmm. A small meal is is really quite quite small. So that's, that's the problem. It's kind of like a glorified snack really. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Okay, um, let's stop here with the large intestine, that's okay. Um, actually, you know what, let me just go over the, just this figure so that you guys, when you're looking at the models, you just know what we're looking at. So, large intestine. Main function of the large intestine is going to be to absorb whatever water that hasn't been absorbed yet. And this is really important in keeping you from becoming dehydrated. It also then is going to allow you to go from this chyme, this very liquid solution, into semi-solid fecal material that you can then defecate. So the large intestine is to absorb that remaining water. You can also absorb ions and vitamins here as well, but not glucose, fatty acids, or amino acids. You are going to restore. You're going to store the um, fecal form and store the fecal material. Now, when you look at the large intestine, different parts to it. You've got the cecum, the appendix, the colon, the rectum, and the anal canal. That's all the large intestine. So let's just look at it, and then we'll stop for today. So the stomach would be up here. The liver would be over here, liver and the gallbladder over here, stomach pancreas over there, and then the first part of the small intestine, the duodenum, then the jejunum is in here, and then ileum. Okay? So most of the small intestine is here in the middle. You can see all this mesentery holding the different parts of the large intestine together. So ileum would come down here. Ileum meets up with the first part of the large intestine, the seat. And this would be where the ileocecal valve is. Then hanging off of the cecum is your appendix. Then you go into the colon. Okay. The colon has different parts. You have the ascending colon, where it turns here. That's called your hepatic flexure because it's up by the liver, also called your right colic flexure. Then you go transverse colon, Another turn, this is your splenic flexure because your spleen's up here, or your left colic flexure. Then you go descending colon, and then usually this is going to be on the back side, on the posterior side, but you've got this little part that goes, kind of wiggles like that. 
that's your sigmoid colon. Like that. Just like that. <laughs> and then you go into the rectum and then the anal canal. And down here you'll have a variety of sphincters in the rectum to keep gas from actually to keep fecal material there and keep fecal material there and gas to be able to leave. And then you'll have a, two sphincters down here, external anal sphincter, internal anal sphincter that are going to be involved in defecation. We'll talk about that. Okay. So that's good. We'll finish this up on Tuesday and then go right into the urinary system. So I'll see you guys upstairs at 8. You can keep my key, obviously. I'll be up there at 8.